So I need to revisit the assumptions around reflection and learning. And I have many assumptions and I'll just share a few of those. And, and I've just stated earlier that one, I believe that students can learn to reflect and that two, teachers can teach students to reflect. So we have to you know, share that assumption that that will happen and is possible in the first place. And I also firmly believe that as teachers, we have a responsibility to scaffold that learning of reflection. And there are many resources and tools out there, and we're developing a whole suite of them here at Macquarie University, where we can start with some very gentle, quick, reflective activities. Um, and I would give examples of things just like the minute paper, short and sharp, non-threatening. It's, it's something that students will be comfortable with. And as students progress with their reflection, we can expand and deepen their repertoire of reflective activities. We cannot assume that all students come into our units knowing how to reflect. Hence the need to support them in learning how to reflect. We also cannot assume that all students are necessarily going to engage with reflective practice at a very deep level. It might be quite superficial, that might suit their learning needs for the moment and for the experience. And we need to be respectful of that, that not all will enter that deep reflective state. And we cannot assume that all students who engage in reflective activity will undergo some sort of transformative experience. Um, many may, you know, many won't. So I think there are also assumptions that we need to consider as caveats, warnings, you know, don't make those assumptions and, and be very responsive to that diversity of students because ultimately what are we looking for? We're looking for students to engage with reflective practice, have some theory about their discipline, go out into their practice experience and the reflection that they undertake has to be the best possible fit for them, for their context, for their need. And that's what we're working towards. Therefore, we have to be very flexible. It's different for, um, as I said, every unit of study, probably every discipline. See, I wouldn't tell them a lot. Okay. I would guide them and let them interact with the activities and learn for themselves. Right, so it's more looking at our, the way we're going to set up the modules with the mm. different stages and scaffolding it as opposed to overtly telling them. Yeah, I w look, at very basically, you know, I would outline what I think the benefits are for them mm -hmm. in terms of supporting them, as I said before, with, you know, um, praxis, with engaging those higher order thinking skills, developing their metacognitive ability and so forth. Um, and it also offers the opportunity to, as I said, to attain that best fit for them between the unit's learning outcomes and their own individual learning needs, all relevant to their practice situation, their um, participation experience. So I would give them very brief, I, I very, very brief outline of why reflect. Mm -hmm. And the most important thing would then be to just have them reflect, engage in the experience with short scaffolded, I'll say that again, with short scaffolded mm -hmm. exercises or activities. One caveat I would put on is that we can't rush reflection. While we can definitely teach reflection, while students can learn reflection, um, we have to allow time for reflection. And in a participation experience, um, we can scaffold, for example, reflection um, so that a student who has not experienced before can be slowly supported with their engagement of reflective practice and we can develop those skills to um, support them in more deep reflection. But we do have to acknowledge that it takes time. And so with participation in particular, uh, we could have some good reflection happening throughout the process. 
we could have some nice summative type reflection at the end of the process. But I would, if I was betting money on it, say that there would be learning through reflection that would happen, you know, six months after the event, 12 months after the event and so forth. It's not easy to teach because it's a layer of experience that we don't normally pay good attention to, particularly in academia. Um, it's more often learned well um, on the job um, or, or even you know, at, implicitly through, through, through modelling other people doing stuff. But um, there is room to, to kind of raise students' awareness of that, give them more access, more explicit access to tools. And so I do it because it makes that kind of difference. It can make, that make a huge difference to their quality as practitioners. For me, reflection is fundamental to all learning. Um, it's like if you're just in the room while something's happening, you could be in the room and paying close attention and aware of what's going on, or you could be in the room and rel relatively spaced out or not very well connected. That difference is really about what kind of process is going on in you as you are connected with or embedded in the situation you're in. And Donald Schoen, who's a guru of reflective practice, talks about a lot about reflection in action. It's hyphenated. Uh, he doesn't actually explicate very much what that is. But the qualities of being present, the ways of being present in a, in a situation make a phenomenal, a huge difference to the level, order of learning that goes on there, both the degree of it and the kinds of it. And uh, so from my point of view as a teacher, one of the things I'm keen to do is to help students raise their awareness of that layer of their own process as, as people working professionally or you know, working as students. And um, so I've done a whole bunch of things in order to facilitate um, that kind of, of appreciation within my students. And they, they range from both explicit teaching about uh, this, the sort of conceptual frameworks and the kinds of methods to um, asking students to, writing exercises for students to use in class where I ask them to check with their feel for the situation they're in, um, in a class exercise. So quite often I'll have a workshop and then, um, then there'll be a reflective practice piece after it, after it. And some of those are explicitly directing people towards that kind of feel for what's going on. Uh, and I also write assignments, which um, in varying ways um, ask students to reflect afterwards, if you like, uh, on that kind of aspect of their, of their, their practice as, as students. You know, because to be a student is to be a different kind of practitioner, somebody who's here trying to learn something. Just as there are whole different ways of thinking about reflection, whole different ways of reflecting, there are different ways of work, making this work for you, and it's going to be a very individual thing. What we'll be doing in most of the units that we're teaching is giving you some ideas about how to do that, some ways of approaching it. That doesn't mean you're stuck with that way in the future, it means that that's something you can work on, that you can adapt and change to your own particular needs. Um, writing is a very powerful way, particularly on your own. So sitting down and just writing the story down about what just happened to you and why it's a problem. It can also be a way of organising your thoughts. So you can use things like um, tables, Venn diagrams, mind maps, stories, all kinds of ways of collecting your thoughts and putting them into some kind of a way that you can observe them. One of the theoretical approaches that I use in much of my research is something called an ecological approach. And as I discuss reflection, I'm constantly making references to that approach. So in an essence, we're looking at the environment of the learner. So that would be, for example, the participation experience, um, but it can also be the learning experience here on campus and the individual student. And in the ecological approach, we're looking at how those two interact and the best possible fit between them taking into account, I'm getting three-dimensional and visual here, that all the other contextual influences on the student and those environments. And that is the only way that we can ever make sense of attaining the best possible learning outcomes and learning for our students if we consider all of those contexts together. We can prepare them as best as we can for a participation experience, but if they go out there and the host supervisor is antagonistic or non-supportive, that's going to be a real challenge for them. Um, vice versa, they may have a poor classroom experience. I'm not here at Macquarie, maybe at another university. Um, but then go out and find the most supportive um, environment in their experience for participation and a wonderful supervisor and still achieve
fantastic learning outcomes. Or there may be other things along the way, you know, as they're travelling to their participation experience, I don't know, they might trip and stub their toe and have a sore toe and that could impact on it. We just need to think of every single possible context. But including what the learner brings into the experience, they're all going to have different histories um, you know, and different past trajectories that have got them to this place that need to be, con that well, we can't know them or we can't consider it all, but we need to allow for flexibility in the reflective experience so that the students can adjust and adapt to suit their own needs.